Hello, everyone. My name is Lopez Matthews, Jr., chair of the Asala TV committee. And today I'm here with David Hochfelder and Ann Fow of Picturing Urban Renewal, an urban renewal project looking at urban renewal in New York between World War II and the early 1970s. And so thank you both for being with us today. Thanks, Thanks for, for having us. us. So part of our project here on Asala TV is to highlight interesting projects that look at history around the nation. And so could you tell us what is the 98 Acres in Albany project, the Picturing Urban Renewal Project, and how did you become interested in it? Um, um, we live in Albany, New York, and Albany is a 19th century city, lots of row houses, 19th century architecture. And right in the middle of the old downtown section of Albany, there's this um, modernist state capital complex built in the 1960s by uh, four-term governor Nelson Rockefeller, and it, it it just doesn't fit the city. So we were always kind of interested in, in why this thing existed. And um, seven years ago, yeah, I think it's been that long, six and a half years ago, we found some photographs in the state archives that documented the neighborhood that existed before the Empire State Plaza was built. So that's really how we got started. Uh, we were researching the local history of urban redevelopment um, here in Albany. A lot of the photographs we found were very striking. They um, showed people in their, in their um, homes and places of business and really humanized um, you know, the history of urban redevelopment here in Albany. Urban renewal and urban redevelopment more generally has is, is usually been talked about at the national policy level by historians. Um, and or focusing on bigger cities than Albany. Or focusing on bigger cities, you know, New York City, Los Angeles, Chicago. Um, but what we found is that there was a real opportunity to use these kinds of photographs along with you know, traditional public history research methods like you know, interviewing people, archival research, to tell a social history of urban renewal that um, is, focused less, is focused more on smaller places like Albany and is focused on the people whose lives were, were affected. So we started blogging as 98 Acres in Albany um, and bringing these, these photographs and other documentation out into the public. So this is a public history project. And then um, three or four years ago, we decided that there are similar stories to be told across the state of New York. Um, so we found uh, documentary materials and photographs similar to what we found here in Albany for Kingston, Newburgh, and Stuyvesant Town and Peter Cooper Village on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. So we decided to launch a four city project with those four places called Picturing Urban Renewal. And uh, we applied successfully for uh, National Endowment for the Humanities support through their digital projects for the public grant program. And we're in the prototyping stage right now of a Picturing Urban Renewal website. And again, this is a, a, a public history project. You know, obviously we'd love to have an academic audience as well, but we're, this is resolutely a public history project. Um, and that's why we're publishing it online as a website and not writing a traditional scholarly book. Um, Anthony? Uh, one thing I do want to say is that part of the way we got to um, to Kingston, Newburgh, mm -hmm. and, and Stuyvesant Town in New York City is because we know people right. who've done research there. Um, Lynn Woods, who is part of a twosome who uh, created a film on urban renewal in Kingston called Lost Roundout, uh, Roundout brought us to Kingston, but she also introduced us to the city historian mm -hmm. in Newburgh. Uh, and via that city historian, we were able to bring the Newburgh urban renewal records up to U Albany. Um, mm -hmm. Sandy Zip introduced us to the story of urban renewal in Stuyvesant Town. Yeah, people have been very generous yeah. with, with their time and there's been a lot of um, public interest um, in the histories of, of their particular locations, you know, cities, including the history of urban renewal. Mm -hmm. I should also acknowledge at this point, there are three of us working on the project. There's myself, mm -hmm. there's Anne, and then our third colleague is Stacy Sewell, who is professor of history at St. Thomas Aquinas College in Nyack, New York. And she is, yeah, she began doing this research with us. She has um, a specialization in labor history, mm -hmm. particularly the construction business. So she brought a really interesting perspective to the story of urban renewal. She can tell a compelling story by going into the state archives 
and looking at the engineering change orders <laughs> when contractors see the Empire State Plaza was a really mm -hmm. crowded job site when construction mm -hmm. was happening. You had several contractors working on different aspects of the project. This resulted in construction delays, and she could go into the archives, look at the engineering change orders and um, you know contract adjustments and tell a really compelling story. And that's a skill, quite honestly, that that I, I simply don't have. <laughs> Me neither. So how has the uh, community reacted to you guys researching this story and putting it together? I'd say I'd say fairly positively. We have a, a an active social media presence as 98 Acres in Albany. Um, we're part of what we're doing for the current NEH grant that we're working on. The prototyping grant is um, we need to rebrand to um, um, better capture the statewide nature of our of our research and storytelling. Um, but that said, here in Albany, the, the reaction has generally been positive. Um, the Empire State Plaza again is is this modernist state office complex. And people here really love it or hate it, but they like the history of the area and are attracted to the history of the area as it existed before demolition and construction of the plaza. So um, we found a, a, um, a fairly positive response to, to the scholarship, to, the, to the, the work that we're doing, the storytelling and, and, and the images that we're, we're presenting. The other thing I should say is a lot of the way we find people to mm -hmm. interview or people to write for us, you know, write the, write about their stories for us, um, is because one former resident introduced us right. to another. Like for example, you know, the son of the owner of Dinty's Tavern introduced us to the son of the shoemaker from across the way on Hudson Avenue. Right. So again, networks and people being generous with their time. That's been, I think, a hallmark of of the Albany research as well as the statewide research that we've embarked on. So, so one of the things that we focus on on Asala TV is, of course, African American history because we are Association for the Study of African American Life and History. And so how does the African American community fit into this sort of story of urban renewal? In that's a um, that's a great question. I think I'll start answering that by describing some of the work we're doing in Newburgh. Um, uh, earlier this year in January 2021, um, we assisted a city planner in Newburgh with the National Park Service African American Civil Rights History Grant application. We're still pending on it. We should hear soon, hopefully positively. I, I, I think it's a strong application, but <laughs> I'm not on the review panel. Um, and the goal of that um, project is to reinterpret the East Newburgh Historic District, which um, like any historic district nomination, this one was done in the mid eighties. Um, the nomination focuses on the buildings and the first owner is the prominent, you know, wealthy white ship, shipping magnates or, or bankers, you know, the wealthy residents of Newburgh. So what the city wants to do is to reinterpret the historic district to include the history of civil rights, urban renewal, housing discrimination. Um, that's worthy history to do on its own in its own right, but a larger goal that the city wants to use this history for is community reparations. So in places like Evanston, Illinois, or Asheville, North Carolina, um, these communities have set up programs of community reparations where if you can demonstrate that your family um, was subject to housing discrimination, those cities will help you with a down payment for, for a home, for example. So Newburgh is looking into doing something similar. So our research won't just reinterpret a historic district, but we hope that it has actual policy implications and, and, and community benefit. And, and I wanna point out that one of the reasons this is so important right now is that Newburgh um, is actually in the process of being gentrified. So new people who don't know this history are moving in and buying some of the really magnificent houses that were part of the urban renewal area and that were taken from people um, to sell to other wealthier people for renovation. Mm -hmm. And that process started at the end of the urban renewal um, era in Newburgh in, in the early and mid 1970s, mm -hmm. where rehabbers moved up from New York City to buy homes. Uh, we just heard from a gentleman um, who bought a home, beautiful, elegant home for like $2,500. Obviously the rehabbing costs significant amounts of money, 
but this process of gentrification you know begins with the rehabbing efforts in the 70s and, and here in albany as well and and those uh rehabbing the gentrification kind of happens in two phases you have the sweat equity era that we're talking about where it's individual homeowners who come in buy a property on the cheap and fix it up now it's more about flows of capital um where money is is going in, in large amounts and it's less about the sweat equity rehabbers and more about how can financial institutions um as well as homeowners you know make money off these these distressed properties so one of the things that uh we talked about in an earlier conversation was that many of the families who were uh moved during urban renewal had to move multiple times. And could you tell us a little bit about that aspect of it? I could take up a little bit of it. I, right now we are working on the Newburgh Urban Renewal Agency records and I have a database that I'm putting together um, using uh, relocation vouchers. And these are vouchers mm -hmm. either for um, moving costs, for rental assistance or for down payment assistance. Um, and we're trying to figure out who all the people are who are living in this area, because it's hard to know until people start really moving out, how many people are in a particular place. Um, and so I will be able to answer you, I will be able to give you a, a stronger answer about numbers and, and specifics of this population when I finished my um, data entry. Dave is doing the same for an earlier urban renewal project in, um, Newburgh, and, and it's wonderful to have this documentation. Um, we don't have the same documentation from Albany that we can always go to the city directory. The problem with the city directory is that um, there are a bunch of people who don't get listed in the city directory. So for example, in Albany, um, about what, you know? A thousand. A thousand of the 7,000 people displaced uh, we're living in rooming houses mm -hmm. and some of those people or they were living in sros um, and some of those people uh, were living pretty stably in a particular rooming house um, but a lot of them moved from place to place to place to, you know living in different furnished rooms with the bathroom down the hall so those are people who don't who aren't considered to have a stable address and so they're not in the city directory and a lot of times they aren't picked up by the um by the by the city officials or state officials who are sent by to count uh, the number of people uh, needing rehousing assistance. Also in, in Newburgh, there, there were two urban renewal projects. The first smaller one um, was launched in the late 50s. And the documents that I was looking at about re residential relocation and business relocation, mm -hmm. a lot of black owned businesses in the area as well. Mm -hmm. um, these are all from 1961 through about 1965 or 66. And you have a lot of what were called temporary on-site relocations, mm -hmm. um, where a relocation officer would come to a particular building and say, oh, this building is substandard because it lacks um, central heat or what have you. So they would relocate the residents to temporary a temporary location on the urban renewal site. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those people who moved you know, further west into um, Newburgh wound up unbeknownst to them wound up moving into what would become the second urban renewal area and we don't know how many people were moved right. multiple times for both urban renewal projects but in some cases you know in the day that i'm assembling on an excel spreadsheet some some households in the early 60s were relocated three or four times um once out of a substandard apartment into a quote-unquote standard apartment on the urban renewal site and then outside of the urban renewal site um and you know, no one enjoys moving, especially if they're forced to. Um, so we don't know. We know from scholars like Mindy Fullalove that um, forced relocation like this results in what she calls root shock. We don't know the psychological effects of multiple relocations. We so, don't also know the community effects. The community effect, correct. And you know that... Uh... That's why I wanted to ask about the demographics of the neighborhoods, because as you study African-American history, you see that this urban renewal has had a devastating effect mm 
on many Black communities. I'm from uh, Baltimore, Maryland, mm -hmm. and we had many urban renewal projects, uh, one being a highway that they built in the middle of the African-American community that they didn't even complete the project, but they displaced an entire community for this project that never actually happened. And uh, there's a famous clip of author James Baldwin talking about urban renewal as urban black remo uh, removal, and that they're trying to remove black people from the cities. And so I just, you know, so I, whenever I hear about urban renewal, whenever I think about it, it always makes me, you know, my mind goes back to that because I know while our focus is particularly African-American, it affected people who were poor yes. all over the country. And so it was more of a class issue rather than simply just a race issue. Race issue. It was a race issue, it was also a class issue. And so I think that that's something I think our viewers will find when they go to your website and look at some of your findings. So um, if I can address that in a couple from a couple directions, um, specifically with Newburgh, and obviously we're talking a lot about Newburgh right now because that's what we're actively researching currently. Mm -hmm. um, around 90% of the population displaced for both the urban renewal projects were African-American. Newburgh also had a large and growing Puerto Rican community. Um, and they were also um, subject to forced relocations for urban renewal as well. Um, in uh, there's a connection to redlining here as well. Redlining began and formally began in the 1930s with the federal government essentially codifying existing local real estate and mortgage lending practices. Um, realtors were redlining or steering, racially steering households as early as the 1920s. And there's documentation in the National Association of Realtors archives about that. Um, that said, the, the way that real estate economists like Homer Hoyt, probably the most famous, um, who shaped FHA um, mortgage and appraisal policies, the way that real estate economists thought about urban decay was that neighborhoods in the city center invariably go from good to bad, to worse. And that's because as poor people move into the center of the city, the housing stock decays, um, elegant homes get cut up into separate apartments or rooming houses. And um, one kind of prima facie piece of evidence that a neighborhood is declining is what was called infiltration. Um, infiltration of foreign born, infiltration, especially Italians or, or uh, people of Slavic descent and infiltration of people of color, including Asians, um, Hispanics, and, and African-Americans. So to real estate economists, the presence of non-Anglo-Saxon Protestants, however you want to define that, was, was, was kind of direct visual eyeball evidence of a neighborhood's inevitable decline. And that turned into a self-fulfilling prophecy where those areas became starved of mortgage and home repair funds and when that happens, obviously, um, it, you know, the quality of the property will, will decline if, if they're being starved of capital. In Newburgh, for example, to bring it back to a specific example, mm -hmm. the appraisals from the, the first smaller urban renewal project from the early 60s um, all had boilerplate language about the neighborhood description. The appraiser dropped the same neighborhood mm -hmm. description into all the appraisals. And the description went something like, um, this neighborhood has no identity except as a slum. It's, uh, uh, um, there's no mortgage money available or home repair money available in this area. And landlords are not keeping up their properties by doing necessary repairs. Uh, the, the, the outlook for this neighborhood is, is hazardous and, and declining. Um, I can try and find the exact quote, but I think that, that, that I'm capturing the flavor of it. In one case, we found a property um, with a photograph that... Um, the appraisal classifies the property as in good condition and it looks in good condition, mm -hmm. but it still has that same neighborhood descriptor. And, and which, which condemns it as part of the blight. Right. Um, but I, I was actually gonna say, here is where we should probably refer to um, renewing inequality mm -hmm. um, as part of the American Panorama Project, which is really fascinating because it um, shows the um, 
it maps the coincidence of redlining mm -hmm. maps and um, urban renewal areas. Right. So if you go into the renewing inequality um, data visualization project, yeah, it'll have those map overlays. And surprise, surprise, there's a great correlation. There's a large mm -hmm. correlation between areas that were subject to redlining and areas that were considered slums and, and destined for urban renewal clearance. Um, you mentioned ex highway construction, and that's not technically part of the federal urban renewal program, but it often accompanied urban renewal. And I'm from Chicago. It had the same impact. It has the same impact, correct. Mm -hmm. And we don't know how many households were uh, dislocated and displaced for either urban renewal or urban expressway construction. But we do know that, again, in a city like Chicago, the Dan Ryan Expressway, its location is no accident. It separates a white Irish neighborhood, which is home to many Chicago mayors, uh, Bridgeport, mm -hmm. from um, um, Bronzeville, the African-American neighborhood to the east. So its location is not accidental. Um, so yes, Chicago, just like your experiences in Baltimore, it's the same thing. So you say that uh, you do interviews and you talk to people. Well, how is, why is it important to have the personal stories as part of the project? I think a part of the reason is that without the personal stories, we just have numbers and pictures. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and we can supplement uh, some of these stories by uh, newspaper research. And Albany, for example, had two really impressive newspapers uh, with really great journalism, journalism, and including uh, writers like William Kennedy, the future Pulitzer Prize winning author of Ironweed. Um, our goal though is to give a voice to people who didn't have a voice either in urban renewal um, or the reconstruction. Um, you know, these are the people who are also most affected by urban renewal because they lost their homes, they lost their communities. Um, uh, just to, to add to that, a um, couple points. Um, these kinds of in interviews are important for a public history project. Again, if we were doing an academic project, we probably would rely less on the interviews, a lot less. Uh, you know, maybe. I, I think, I, you know, I'm not sure that I agree with that. I think okay. that. Um, there's, there's, we have a lot of quantitative information, again, about the people displaced. I can go to the census, I can go to, you know, uh, state records about um, displacement, relocation, demolition, you know, um, uh, in Albany, but, you know, I have to go, and, 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 and I will say that we do have some great information, visual information in the form of pictures, and that's the reason why this project is called Picturing Urban Renewal. Um, but, you know, this, that's a snapshot in time. If you want to know what that area was like and what its loss meant to people, you really have to go talk to them. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree with that. Um, something else we're trying to do with our blog, the Albany specific blog is um, to give voice to people, but also a, a allow them to tell their stories in their own voices. We, we have um, several guest posts. Um, in some cases, uh, uh, the guest posts are um, similar to what we would do, which is to interview people and then write up their stories, like um, um, Catherine, Gallian. Catherine Gallian, who wrote about her family's house, and then also wrote a couple of other posts about um, a dairy that was located mm -hmm. um, in, in, in the take area. And- um, A popular uh, bar. Popular bar called the Palais Royale. That's that still survived. Survived and relocated. Yeah. Um, but the, the dairy story that Catherine wrote for the blog, for example, she interviewed the son of the president, the last president of the dairy, mm -hmm. and got tons and tons of photographs, slides and so forth, and documentation from the family. Um, so this really allows us through the guest post and also just interviewing and, and, and allowing people to, to tell their own stories and their own voices. Um, again, this is, you know, part of what makes this a public history project, but it's also, it, it also humanizes the story of urban renewal in ways that, that archival or documentary research simply, you know, as Anne said, simply can't portray. So, um, what did urban renewal mean from a variety of perspectives? Mm -hmm. 
what did urban renewal mean to the people who experienced it? Um, and we're trying to capture a, a diverse range of perspectives ranging from journalists and photographers who covered the story of urban renewal in their communities, to the people who were displaced, to the politicians and, and um, um, planners who thought they were doing something worthwhile for their communities, um, to some of the rehabbers who bought these homes in Newburgh, we're hearing from some, you know, several of those. So we're really trying to tell as complete a range, as complete a story as we can. And in order to do that, you need a diverse range of perspectives. And in order to get those perspectives, you need to talk to people. Because the archives isn't going to give you that st those stories. Right. Right. So uh, one of the things you've mentioned kind of throughout is the support you've received from the community and other researchers and how important has networking and working with other people been to moving the project forward? Well, we'd still be 98 in acres in <laughs> Albany if it weren't for Lynn Woods and Mary McTammany is what I'll say. So right. it, it's really key to allowing this project to grow. But beyond that, you know, Dave is really the master networker here. You know, he sees some some mention of a project that's aligned to what we're doing or he reads an article you know in in a journal and he he's he's making a call he's sending an email he's writing a letter yeah um so just for example the three um contacts i sent you Corey allen in newburgh um works for habitat for human for habitat, habitat for humanity and is co-chair of the newburgh housing coalition his grandfather had a, a candy store and an apartment above the candy store that he lived in, um, in Newburgh that was taken for urban renewal. Corey's got a wonderful story to tell about urban renewal and about how it's, it continues to affect Newburgh. Um, also about how the city is planning to address those inequities moving forward. Exactly, exactly. Um, the mapping segregation folks, Mara and Sarah, um, you know, they're doing really significant, needful work in Washington, D.C., showing the history, mapping the history and telling, you know, humanizing, you know, humanizing the process of racial discrimination and restrictive covenants. Um, so, you know, these are the, the more that we learn about each other's projects and I'm just talking about people who are doing projects. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, the stronger that our individual work products will be, but more importantly, you know, again, we couldn't do this project without people introducing us to other people mm -hmm. and kind of building this this network. So it, it's it, from a, a personal research standpoint, this kind of networking has been very significant. You know, as Anne said, we'd still be working on Albany only. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's exciting to get to know people who are making real significant interventions into their communities today. And to seeing what ideas we can borrow and right. whether or not we can help. Right. And so my final question is, is there anything else that you would like anyone to know about the project? Yeah, I think um, a related uh, National Endowment for the Humanities grant that we're working on is to assemble a statewide inventory of urban renewal records that are held locally. And in New York, they're held in around 80 different locations, 80 different municipalities. Urban renewal happened in 1,300, roughly, communities across the United States, ranging in size from villages of a few thousand to major cities. Also happened in Puerto Rico. Um, these stories are out there. Um, every, you know, 1,300 cities, towns, and villages were affected by urban renewal. And I would love for people to start digging into local records and telling their community's history of not just urban renewal, but um, housing discrimination, restrictive covenants, um, redlining, all of these housing practices that have, for better or for worse, shaped the modern urban landscape. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a, a huge opportunity and there's a public interest and hunger for this history as well. So I would love to see many more projects um, local and public history projects about urban renewal and other aspects of urban history. And I think one thing we have learned from the research that we've done is that urban renewal is as much a local story as it is a federal story, as it is a national story. Yes. Um, I guess something else by way of conclusion, 
I'm, I define myself as, as a public historian. I, I direct our public history program here at University of Albany SUNY. Um, I would generally like to see those of us who do this kind of research to do it with an eye toward the public audience and less toward the scholarly, the scholarly audience. I mean, I think engaging scholars and other researchers and academics is important, but I really think that the power of history generally is with its public interest and, and ability to create public engage, opportunities for public engagement. So that leads me into my uh, next question, which is how can people learn more about the project or, and possibly help? Well, we've posted some links into the chat um, okay. and you know, feel free to use those however you see fit. But to answer your question directly, if you Google 98 Acres in Albany, you will get to our WordPress blog um, and probably our social media presence. Um, we're on Facebook and Twitter. We're on Facebook and Twitter. I haven't really figured out Instagram. Right. Um, and as far as picturing urban renewal is concerned, we would be happy to share. Um, we have a design document, for example, that we submitted to NEH for round two of funding. We'd be happy to share that with folks. We don't have a web presence as picturing urban renewal yet because our website is under development and we need to rebrand away from Albany to reflect the statewide nature of the work. Um, urban Archive. Urban Archive. Uh, we, it's a touring platform. We've contributed content in Albany and we don't Newburgh yet. We, we're we're, we're Newburgh. planning to move into Newburgh, right. but we just, um, added content to Albany and two stories. You can tour, uh, we have a great migration tour. Mm -hmm. We also have a, a bar crawl. So come to Albany. Come to Albany, great migration tour and the bar crawl afterwards. There will be more tours. Um, there'll be more, yes. Um, we also did a piece for the Inclusive Historians Handbook, which is an online publication um, jointly published by the American Association for State and Local History and the National Council on Public History. So if you Google um, the Inclusive Historians Handbook, Urban Renewal, our, our piece will show up. Um, Ann and Stacy wrote an article for the Journal of Planning History a couple of years ago on Newburgh. Uh, I think it appeared in the summer 2019 issue. No, it was, uh, it was winter 2020. It was the last summer? Anyway, well, it's anyway, called it's... Newberg's Last Chance, Ann Fowl, PFAU, Stacy Sewell, S-E-W-E-L-L. -L. So those should give people a, a sense of the kind of research we're doing. And hopefully we'll have a lot more to, to show, you know, in the next year or two. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, for all our viewers, you will see those links on screen and they will also be in the description down below this video on YouTube. So you can review those and check out the great work of David and Anne and learn more about their work with Urban Renewal. And so I hope that you all have learned something great today. Thank you for viewing our Solid TV episode. And as I said, check out the links down below. Subscribe to this channel for more great discussions about projects related to African-American history and projects related to history in general. And so thank you all for watching and have a great day. Thank you.